Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Alexander the Great, the early years, as we continue our study of Between the Testaments. Our story takes us, first of all, notice we have the Persian Empire stretching from the Aegean all the way, really, to the borders of India. Um, and that empire had now come into around 200 years by the time Alexander comes on the scene. But to look at Alexander, we're going to look to the west, and there in the area of Greece, let's, let's blow that up. Um, notice we have the city, we have actually got a number of city-states, I'm just putting some of the key ones here, Athens, Thebes, and Sparta. Remember, Athens and Thebes had had a period of warfare, not sure if we talked about it in this class, but they'd gone through a period where the Persians were backing, usually backing Sparta against Athens, um, but uh, in a sense almost applying um, arms to both of them so they could fight each other and, and nullify themselves. Uh, but to the north, you had Macedonia. That's where Alexander is going to come from. Uh, also, the kingdom of Thrace to the east of that. And then also you have Greeks. Notice um, uh, the Ionian Greeks uh, sp spoke of sort of a funny sign sounding dialect of Greek. Uh, Macedonians didn't actually speak Greek. They had their own language. But um, by the end, by the time of Alexander, and especially by the end time, uh, by the time he dies, um, we're going to have Macedonians um, maybe being bilingual, where Greek is going to be picked up by them. And it will be a, of a style that we know as common Greek, or we say Koine Greek. Now, the story of Alexander really starts with his father, Philip of Macedon, who had not he wasn't the oldest of, uh, he had older brothers, so he didn't really expect to be king. Uh, but when he was a young man, he had been a hostage in uh, the city of Thebes. Um, his his uh, father had done so well against Thebes, and, and he'd been held hostage. Now, he wasn't in a prison or anything like that, but he, he, but, uh, he was confined to the city. And while he was there, um, the story goes, and, and um, there's a little bit of uh, um, disagreement on on how much of an influence this was. He saw Thebes take on a, uh, a larger force. And I have to explain a little bit how uh, warfare would take place uh, among the Greeks of that era. They would line up, notice I've got you know two colors uh, representing two uh, opposing forces, and then they would come together and, and do a pushing match, and whoever would push the other back would, would win. Eventually, the, the people that are being pushed back are going to start going back a little faster, and maybe they'll break and run away. Uh, and that's how you would win the battle. Um, we believe it's in Thebes, although it's not entirely clear about this, that he saw uh, Thebes uh, set up their lines on, um, notice, they're, they're sort of curved. Um, instead of just, and what this would do as the enemy would come forward, wait a minute, you're not meeting us straight on, you're meeting us on uh, sort of what we call an oblique line, uh, sort of curved to the side. Um, and the tendency would be that as if you're uh, holding your shield in your right hand and your your uh, spear in, I'm sorry, your spear in your right hand, your shield in your left hand, that you'll, ten you'll there'll be a slight tendency to move maybe to the left when you shouldn't. Uh, and if the entire line does that, but they don't do it uniformly, then you can have a break in the line, and eventually um, what you can do is break through. Instead of having to push the entire body back, you can break through it at one of these weak points. Um, and so uh, that idea of the breakthrough, now Philip's going to see that, whether he really learns it at Thebes or not, he's going to adopt this idea and pass it on to his son, Alexander. Uh, Philip uh, eventually does become king in 359 BC, and as such, he marries a number of women. Now, the Greeks didn't normally do this, but remember, he's Macedonian, uh, sort of Greek, uh, although they've got their separate language. And uh, Paris is the kingdom to the west of Macedonia, and uh, he marries Olympia. Now, he marries a number of women. Um, the Greeks normally had one wife, but Philip... Um, had a bunch of wives, some of them at the same time. Um, and so he marries Olympia of Epirus, and they're going to have a son, and their son's going to be Alexander. <clears throat> now, Alexander's childhood, and 
uh, he was uh, he wasn't the only child that they had, or, or only child that Philip had, I should say. Uh, but it seems pretty early on that he was destined uh, to be Philip's heir. And the story is told of how um, when Alexander was just a little boy, that there was a horse that had been uh, given to Philip and uh, was a, a magnificent stallion. Uh, and it, was, it just seemed to be untamable. Um, and so uh, they were trying to break the horse. I've, 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 I've had a little tiny experience trying to do this. I remember trying to go for a ride on a, an unbroken horse. It was a very short ride. Um, and they were having the same problem. And Alexander was watching, and he said, Father, let me try the horse. Let me try to ride the horse. And, uh, well, you're too young for this. Even even my expert riders are having problems with this horse. You, you know, I can't have you. Oh, but Father, let me do it. Uh, and he insisted. And finally, uh, Philip said, well, okay, you know, I can always have another son. Um, and uh, Alexander goes to the horse and takes him by the halter and instead of, you know, just jumping immediately on his back, uh, speaks soothingly to him and then turns him so that he's facing the sun uh, because, because Alexander had noticed that the horse would see his shadow and rear up and, and was startled by it. And so faces him into the sun and then speaks soothingly to him. And then, then after a bit, just jumps on his back and the horse doesn't buck. He just rides away. Uh, now, he gives the, the name of this horse, Bucephalus. Um, and uh, Bucephalus, um, this isn't just the Cephal Legends, Bucephalus is going to go with him on his travels, uh, really all the way to India. Um, the horses don't live all that long, but Bucephalus is going to be an aged stallion, uh, not necessarily going into battle for all that time, but will travel with, with Alexander. And, and the story goes that Philip's father uh, watches his son ride this wild horse uh, and yet tamed by him and says to him, uh, my son, uh, Macedonia will not be big enough of a kingdom for you. Well, Persian envoys come to Philip's uh, palace. And again, a story is told, and Alexander's still a boy. And he goes out to see them while, while they're waiting to see his father. And he begins to question them uh, regarding the the uh, the roads and the network and the communications uh, that are there in the Persian Empire, almost as though uh, what he's doing, uh, he is interrogating them uh, as if they were sort of a, a resource for him. Uh, already, it seems he has this plan, this idea, uh, I want to go to Persia. And, I'm, you know, of course, that's not my country. I'm going to go there um, perhaps as a future uh, com um military person as a future conqueror. Now, Alexander has a number of tutors. Uh, one of them early on is the uh, man Leonidas, uh, sort of uh, started him off. But as he goes into his uh, early teens, uh, Aristotle, the same Aristotle who was the philosopher, uh, actually, Aristotle was Macedonian, so this isn't too far of a stretch. Uh, he had gone down to uh, to Athens, and he had been a student of Plato, and now he comes back and he serves as a tutor to Alexander as well as to some of his own um, companions. Uh, so a number of them sit under uh, Aristotle's tutelage, and Alexander really had a, a love for this older philosopher. Now, by the time Alexander, he's still a teenager, when Philip is fighting a battle, the Battle of uh, Carianoia, and Alexander actually is serving as one of the captains in this battle. Uh, Philip is commanding the right wing, and Alexander is commanding the left wing uh, as a teenager. Um, and it's a, it's a victory. Um, it's at this time that we begin to see um, the formation of the army. Instead of the the typical soldier that the Greeks would have, where they they would have the helot, the um, uh, a Greek soldier would carry a spear, maybe maybe uh, six, eight, maybe even ten feet long, and a shield. Um, in Philip's case, he is going to expand that that spear uh, all the way up to about eighteen feet. 
It's going to be very, very long. And then deepen the ranks of his soldiers so that you'll, um, what you're looking at here is a Macedonian phalanx. And trying to attack a group like this, and they're very heavily disciplined. They can turn on a dime. Uh, they can go through their various maneuvers. They can get into this formation very, very quickly. Um, and uh, coming up against that is like going up against a porcupine. It's, you know, uh, uh, they are they're very well disciplined. Uh, they're ready to fight. And this is going to be the formation that wins both Philip and then later on his son Alexander uh, battle after battle after battle. Now, Alexander and Philip, um, even though father and son, there was uh, great respect, uh, but there was also trouble there, uh, especially when Philip uh, took for himself a new wife. He already had a number of wives, uh, but uh, a new wife. And there was a quarrel there when, when, the, when the new father-in-law uh, said, uh, may, may you have a legitimate son. Now, what was happening there with this new wife was also a Macedonian. And remember that uh, Olympia, Alexander's mother, she was not Macedonian. She was from uh, a, a neighboring kingdom. And so the idea here was, well, may you have a, a legitimate son that's really, that's really fully Macedonian, not just half Macedonian, half something else. And Alexander heard, the, heard this, and he was furious. He was ready to fight. He was ready to kill. Uh, and, and Philip, you know, Alexander yelled and screamed. And, and Philip, uh, taking the part of his new bride, um, uh, became angry with Alexander. And they almost had it out. And, and uh, remember, uh, weddings back then was not where you would walk down the aisle. Weddings uh, were where you would arrange the wedding party, and then you'd have a great party, and there'd be a lot of drinking. And then uh, uh, the bride and groom would, you know, go off on their, you know, to the other room for their honeymoon and then come back. Uh, so th there'd been a lot of drinking and uh, they, they became very angry. And Philip, you know, went and got a, uh, a I don't know if it was a sword or a spear, uh, ready to go in and take out his son, Alexander. And, but was so drunk, he tripped over uh, something, he fell on his face. And Alexander said, this is the man who would, who would cross into into Asia? He can't even cross a room, and there was some just some bad blood uh, between the two. And so Alexander was forced now to go for a time into exile. Now eventually he returns. Uh, eventually he and his father reconcile, but there was some quarrelsome uh, things taking place. I can't help but wonder if Mom Olympia uh, had a part in that. I, I'm I'm not sure. <clears throat> but eventually they do, they do come back, they are reconciled, and then Philip, shortly after that, is murdered, he is assassinated uh, by a, uh, a young man that was um, in their entourage, you know, uh, in the palace. Uh, it was a young man who had, there's no nice way to say this, at one of these sort of drinking parties, um, people had gotten drunk, and this young man had been raped by some of Philip's other guests. That's not nice. And when he had complained to Philip, Philip had just sort of, you know, brushed it off. Well, boys will be boys and, um, and hadn't really done anything about it. And so now this young man comes up and murders Philip. And, and then, you know, he, I mean, he, he does, it's not like in private. It's not, you know, behind closed doors. It's out in public when it happens. And he is quickly uh, captured and killed uh, before he can be questioned. People have wondered, uh, did Alexander have any part in maybe putting him up to it? Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, Alexander doesn't seem to uh, have had that sort of, you know, go, going behind people's back. Uh, Alexander can be angry and he can kill somebody at, at, at times but not usually in a way like this. Uh, so I suspect not, but, you know, I wasn't there. And, and even the people were, uh, they, they questioned it, but, and, and they wondered, you know, what's going on there. But now Alexander, who admittedly did have a lot to gain, he now becomes the new king of Macedonia, a very young king, just barely turned 20. Alexander is 20 years old. In the next 13 years, he will conquer what for him was the known world. But first, but first he has to conquer or reconquer 
Greece, and the surrounding regions.